Okay, let's get this party started. Hello, I'm Father Timothy Matkin, and this is uh, Matins. Let's see, episode number 15. And uh, this is the month of November, the month of the Holy Souls. So we're talking about the theme of purgatory and the Anglican take on the subject. I've been asked about that a few times, and so it's, uh, it's good to be able to finally uh, address that and fill in uh, some people's knowledge about that subject. Before we go any further, if you'd like to uh, write to me, you can write to me at frmatkin at priest.com. You can also comment down below on YouTube. Uh, and if you would, uh, if you find this valuable and enriching, please give us a like, share it uh, with someone else, um, either directly or on Facebook or Twitter or something like that. If you're listening on uh, Apple or Spotify, if you would uh, give us a review, and uh, that helps us uh, become more noticed out there. We want to pick up where we left off last time, uh, and before we get there, we want to have a prayer from the prayer book, and I thought we would turn again to the burial rite. And uh, the part at the end is called the committal, where you actually put the body in the ground in its final resting place or in its niche in a columbarium or something like that. And it's very short, and it's, it's, it's perhaps the part that is most familiar to people from movies and television, things like that. So this is the graveside part. Uh, so we've left the church and the funeral mass there, and we've gone to the graveside. And it begins with a, an anthem, which is basically a couple of sentences. And then there's a short prayer, which is um, where you put the body in the ground. Um, and, of course, as I mentioned before, it's like pulling teeth to get people to actually do that. Um, but that's how it's designed, is that there's a very short anthem, you put the body in the ground, and then you say this prayer where you get the f very familiar ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And that's where you cast um, dirt onto the coffin, basically starting the burial process. And uh, as we talked about before also, I think this was the Queen Elizabeth uh, funeral uh, episode, um, but the best burial I've ever been to was where we had a shovel, and we basically passed it around, and everybody kind of took turn um, filling in the hole. And uh, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's designed. So anyway, let's begin with prayer. So we'll have that uh, brief anthem, and then the uh, prayer that goes along with um, casting earth upon the coffin. Man that is born of woman hath but a short time to live, and is full of misery. He cometh up, and is cut down like a flower. He fleeth as it were a shadow, and never continueth in one stay. In the midst of life we are in death. Of whom may we seek for succor, but of thee, O Lord, who for our sins art justly displeased. Yet, O Lord God most holy, O Lord most mighty, O holy and merciful Saviour, Deliver us not into the bitter pains of eternal death. Thou knowest, Lord, the secret of our hearts. Shut not thy merciful ears to our prayer, but spare us, Lord most holy, O God most mighty, O holy and merciful Saviour, thou most worthy judge eternal. Suffer us not at our last hour for any pains of death to fall from thee. And then the note, the rubric says, While the earth is cast upon the coffin, the efficient says these words, Ensure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. We commend to Almighty God, our brother or sister, and give the name, and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Lord bless him and keep him. The Lord make his face to shine upon him and be gracious unto him. The Lord lift up his countenance upon him and give him peace. Amen. And it's interesting that that is, I believe, the only time that the Aaronic blessing uh, occurs in the prayer book, in the basically Christian liturgy. Uh, so you have the Jewish Kohenim blessing that comes from the instructions given to Aaron in the Torah. And uh, it's used there as sort of a final farewell um, until Resurrection Day. Well, let's continue where we left off. We talked about the 39 articles, and we're going through um, the commentary by Bicknell, 
uh, which is one of the uh, couple of main commentaries, just to kind of remind ourselves where we've been. If you haven't seen the episode from last time, go back and watch episode 14, and so you can uh, get where we were before. Um, Remember the article is article number 22. Uh, It goes like this. The Romish doctrine concerning purgatory, pardons, worshiping and adoration, as well as images and of relics, and also invocation of saints, is a fond thing, vainly invented, and grounded upon no warranty of Scripture, but rather repugnant to the Word of God. A couple of things to keep in mind is that uh, the articles, the original, is in Latin, and so that's a helpful guide in terms of interpreting um, the articles and uh, commenting upon them. Um, Let me see, what is... um, When it says repugnant to the word of God, the Latin word is contradictit, or contradicit. I'm not sure how you say it. Um, And so it it, kind of helps illuminate what exactly does that mean. So repugnant is perhaps more of a poetic description, whereas the Latin is just saying, well, what we're talking about here is it goes against the scriptures. It contradicts something in them. That's why it's repugnant, uh, because it doesn't uh, fall in line with what is revealed in the scriptures. If you recall uh, the things we touched upon last time in his commentary, a few things to note. Uh, There is what we call an intermediate state between death and the general resurrection of everyone at the last day. And so um, sometimes uh, we've applied the word purgatory to that. Uh, Anglicans generally shy away from Uh, using the word purgatory, uh, just to avoid misconceptions and and misimpressions and things like that. So we're not against the doctrine of purgatory. We're against the Romish corruption of the doctrine of purgatory. So that's why we tend to avoid that word. But what we do firmly uh, uphold is that there is an intermediate state between now and then. And a logic would dictate that there is some growth and development during that state, just as there was in the state of life, that that continues on. So that's some of the things that he points out in commenting upon that. He also reviewed a little bit that um, prayer for the dead is uh, very ancient, goes back to even pre-Christian days to our Jewish heritage, Um, that prayer for the dead doesn't necessitate belief in everything that comes later with the more speculative questions and answers that we get in the later Middle Ages. And that's basically what we'll pick up here. We'll, we'll back up just a little bit. Uh, in my copy, this is page uh, 281, in different copies. In the online copy that's linked in the uh, show notes, it's a little different. It's a different page. Um, so if you're following along in the text, you just have to go look for it. But we begin with um, backing up to the mention of Augustine and basically the the going beyond what Scripture has to say about it. Uh, So he says, The great name of Augustine was sufficient to win general acceptance for his teaching in the West. But it remains still an opinion, his opinion about purgatory, about uh, a purifying fire and uh, his ideas about perhaps punishments uh, that are yet to be... um, satisfied in this life being uh, satisfied in the next. Sort of like, you know, if you don't do your classwork, you've got to take it home and do it as homework. That kind of approach to this question. So it remained an opinion. Not until the close of the 6th century do we find this doctrine of purgatory endowed with any semblance of authority. So Augustine's the 4th century. In his dialogues, Gregory the Great Um, The question is raised, are we to believe in a purgatorial fire after death? So notice how the question is posed, not do we believe in a purgatory, by that time it's just a common accepted understanding, but rather what is purgatory like? Are we to believe in a purgatorial fire after death? Clearly it was a legitimate subject for discussion. The answer is given that a purgatorial fire before the judgment for certain light faults is to be believed. Such faults include unbridled conversation, 
immoderate laughter, undue anxieties, mistakes due to ignorance, including adherence to the wrong pope when there was a, dis a dispute about who the real pope is. Gregory's teaching makes use of certain stock texts, such as 1 Corinthians 3.15 uh, and Matthew 12.32, but its real support is the series of thrilling ghost stories, which form a large part of the dialogues. In fact, it was claimed that a whole flood of new light had been shed upon the condition of the departed by recent revelations and apparitions. We need to remember that the medieval doctrine of purgatory rested for the most part upon the visions narrated by Gregory, reinforced by fuller and later evidence of the same precarious nature. In plain English, an un uncritical age was unable to distinguish between nightmares and revelations, that is, between biblical and extra-biblical data. And so when we get to Gr Pope Gregory the Great, and we love Gregory the Great. He's a saint, a wonderful saint. He's the one who uh, sent the um, mission of Augustine to Canterbury. Uh, so he plays a big, uh, important part in Anglican history. Uh, but here we see crossing a kind of threshold, going beyond what mere scripture warrants and getting into speculation. And so we firmly adhere to up to that threshold where we are based on scripture uh, but we can't necessarily follow what goes beyond with speculation. We can be open to speculation, but with the Anglican approach to doctrinal um, matters, uh, we can only require what is firmly revealed and is a part of the written record of Revelation and uh, the commentary uh, on the, uh, by the fathers, uh, helping us understand what's in that revelation. So Bicknell continues, the conception of purgatory as a place of fiery torment from which a few of even the holiest Christians could hope to be exempt came to be the dominant feature of medieval Christianity. Uh, let me pause there just for a minute to fill in the background if you may not be familiar. So the early church's um, take on this was that the martyrs are the only ones who go directly to heaven. And by heaven we mean being at home with God, in union with God, experiencing the beatific vision. Um, no more growth left to happen uh, until they reach God. So in a sense, their martyrdom was their purgatory. Their martyrdom was that painful letting go of all things material and um, carnal and so on. For the rest of us, we still have to go through some letting go, and we have to go through some growth and... Uh, but in their martyrdom, they demonstrated that they loved God even more than their own selves. The rest of us who are saved have to go through some kind of purgation. Um, and then some uh, mistakenly kind of had the speculation that uh, purgatory is like a hell um, that you can work yourself out of, uh, get out of by good behavior. Um, the reality is different from that. Only the saved go to purgatory, um, and it is, by nature and definition, limited. It can't be eternal. Um, it's a process, whereas hell is fundamentally different in that it's a destination. Um, it is ultimately being shut out from God's presence. So, with that in mind, let's continue. As set forth by the schoolmen, it, purgatory, had become further corrupted by the new and terrible notion that punishment was satisfaction for sins. In order to place the current system on a rational basis, the distinction was elaborated between the guilt, the culpa, and the punishment, pena, incurred by sin. Guilt, it was held, was forgiven in absolution. But the punishment, or we might say the consequences, had still to be borne, uh, or had to be borne, Sorry, the punishment that had to be borne still remained. So it makes logical sense, you know. Um, think of it in human relationships. You can go to somebody, say, I'm sorry, they forgive you, but there's still the consequences of your actions, the practical results that you have to deal with, whether it's, you know, being impoverished or um, losing your job or, you know, whatever. 
In practice, men came to think little of the guilt, because the guilt was all taken care of by Christ's forgiveness. That was forgiven through the merits of the cross of Christ, and the slightest compunction, a tear or a prayer to the Virgin, were sufficient to procure the divine forgiveness through the Church's absolution. Then the sinner was safe from the eternal pains of hell. But purgatory was more serious, because purgatory is what you were facing. The full measure of punishment had to be worked off, if not in this world, then in the next. God was bound to exact up to the last farthing. That's a re reference to Jesus' comment in Matthew. God was bound to exact up to the last farthing, the retribution due to sin. Accordingly, the chief aim in life came to be to make provision against the torments of purgatory. These could be reduced in advance by the performance of pilgrimages and other good works and by the purchase of pardons. Pardon is the English translation of indulgence. An indulgence is a commutation of, a, of an ecclesiastical sentence, at least in the, in the original. It kind of, kind of gets altered and corrupted and morphed into something a little different uh, when you bring it together with the afterlife. Even after death, the release of the soul could be hastened by prayers and masses and the acquisition of pardons to be placed to the account of the departed. The whole matter was placed on a quantitative basis. The disciplinary aspect of purgatorial suffering had retreated to the secondary position. So it, 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 as time goes on, it becomes more and more kind of technical, mathematic, judicial, um, about working off your sufferings before you get there, or helping someone else work off their sufferings once they've arrived. And um, the old um, view of indulgences as reducing ecclesiastical sentences gets sort of applied to purgatory, where you think, well, this indulgence will work off, um, you know, 365 days, um, which is how it was reckoned in terms of reducing commuting ecclesiastical sentences, uh, where, you know, you're, you're kicked out of church for five years. Well, you've done this good behavior. Okay, you can come in a year early, something like that. Hence, the growth of solitary masses and the springing up of the chantry system. And so those are basically continuous requiems. Indeed, the chief value of the mass came to be regarded as an insurance against the pains of purgatory. The clergy became purveyors of salvation at a fixed tariff. The laity proved themselves eager customers. The doctrine was officially formulated for the first time by a council in 1439 by the Council of Florence. We have traveled far, I will not say from Scripture, but from Augustine and Gregory. We cannot wonder that the bitterest attacks of the Reformers were directed against purgatory and everything connected with it, even the Mass itself. So it's not surprising that this ends up being one of the most corrupt parts of the corruption of the Middle Ages. And in some places, it's more than others. So in England, it's not nearly as bad as in Germany, for example. This whole idea of raising money by selling indulgences and all that kind of stuff, which is not allowed um, by, uh, under canon law. And that was the, one of the first reforms that was taken care of, is that uh, we're not doing that. that. That doesn't work that way. Anytime you buy or sell an indulgence, um, basically, you've, <laughs> you've squandered your money. It doesn't do you any good. All right, let's see. We cannot wonder that the bitterest attacks of the Reformers were directed against purgatory and everything connected with it, even the Mass itself. Purgatory seems to have been invented to fill the coffers of the Church. The language of our article is amply justified. Such doctrine was not only grounded upon no warrant of Scripture, but repugnant to the word of God. And remember the Latin contradicted the word of God. Christianity had been degraded into a religion of fear, darker even than the terrors of pagan superstition. The Council of Trent fully admitted the evils. 
So Trent, the reforming council, recognized the corruptions and the problems. It forbade the discussion of the more difficult and subtle questions in popular discourses. So it recognized that the talk out there amongst the laity, the, 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 the peasantry, and so on, got very speculative and very superstitious. And it says, you know, let's not go there. Let's not even address those things. Those, that's all just speculation. There is no scriptural, traditional answer to all of these questions. Trent commanded the bishops to prohibit as scandals and stumbling blocks to the faithful those things which tend to a certain kind of curiosity or superstition or which savor of filthy lucre. And all of those are quotes from Trent. But, on the other hand, Trent lacked the discernment or the courage to condemn the real root of the evil. It at least left open the view that the state of the faithful departed is chiefly one of suffering. It declared that there is a purgatory, and, sorry, <laughs> that there is a purgatory, and that the souls there detained are relieved by the suffrages of the faithful, but chiefly by the, accept the acceptable sacrifice of the altar. That is at present the official teaching of the Roman Church. But the catechism put forth by the council goes further and speaks of a purgatorial fire in which the souls are tormented, crucitate, if I'm saying that right. And popular Roman teaching, approved by the highest authorities, is still further removed from the cautious assertion of Trent. No doubt the Roman doctrine may be represented, may be presented in a most refined and spiritual way. So Bicknell is saying, well, look, if we just look at Trent, it's very moderate. It's basically pretty much acceptable to us. It's very restrained. Um, but still, there's a lot of pressing beyond that with further speculation that becomes popular in wider Roman Catholic um, theology and discussion about the subject. So, no doubt, the Roman doctrine may be presented in a most refined and spiritual way, but we may fairly complain that no attempt is made to control extravagant and superstitious ideas. There is a wide gulf between the theological minimum defended by Roman apologists and the lucrative exaggerations of popular teaching. And, of course, a lot of that has been um, backed off since Vatican II and the whole kind of change and focus in Roman Catholic theology. So this, this was written, I think, in 1919, so it's a different atmosphere back then. What then can we say about the whole idea of purification through suffering after death? It is, so this is, he's coming to his conclusion section uh, in dealing with purgatory and the articles of religion. What then can we say about the whole idea of purification through suffering after death. In other words, what can we say about that more kind of speculative part of the discussion? It is more than doubtful if the often quoted passage in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, and this is Paul talking about judgment day and the judgment comes with fire and every man in his life is piling up a pile of his works, good works and bad works and everything else in between. And the good works are jewels and, and um, gold and things like that, things that endure the fire. And the rest of it is just wood, hay, straw, things that burn up on Judgment Day. And what you have left is just the good works. Everything else is burned away. And you'll be saved, but you'll be saved by going through that fire. So it's more than doubtful if the often quoted passage in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 has any real bearing on the subject, the subject of purification through suffering. St. Paul is referring to Christian teachers. Their work will be tested at the day of judgment. Only that which is built upon the finest materials will be able to endure the test. All unworthy work will be destroyed, but the teacher himself, though he suffers the loss of his reward, Will, be, will escape as through fire, a proverbial expression, like a brand plucked from the burning. There is no reference to the time between death and judgment, and no mention of purification of character. 
so too. So the fire that he mentions is just a, a judgment, an evaluation. It doesn't really talk about growth, maturity, getting better. Um, it, it's, it's more describing a moment in time. So too, texts like Matthew 5, 26, where Jesus says, you won't get out of the prison until you pay the last penny or farthing. Or Matthew 18, 34, till he should pay all that was due, seem to picture rather an endless term of punishment. An infinite time is not sufficient in which to pay off an infinite debt. Nor again can we argue dogmatically that if a sin, quote, shall not be forgiven in this world or that which is to come, Matthew 12, 32, therefore some sins must be forgiven in the next world. The emphasis is laid, rather, on the incurable nature of the particular sin. That is, that we can't take care of it. It's only going to be solved by God's grace. In short, even the doctrine of purgatorial suffering after death, in whatever form it is held, can hardly claim to be proved from Scripture, and the Church of England is therefore perfectly justified in refusing to enforce it as an article of belief. So here, pay very close attention to his words. He's saying that this is a matter of speculation. It doesn't follow directly out of Scripture. It can't be proved from Scripture. Thus, we can't require it for belief. We don't forbid it, but we can't require it. All we can require is that which is a part of revelation from God. So let me read that line again. In short, even the doctrine of purgatorial suffering after death, not the doctrine of purgatory, the intermediate state, but the doctrine of purgatorial suffering after death, in whatever form it is held, can hardly claim to be proved from Scripture, and the Church of England is therefore, therefore perfectly justified in refusing to enforce it as an article of belief. At the same time, as we have seen, such a belief, suffering after death, has been widely held in various forms in all parts of the church, east and west, since the second century, and is entirely in accordance with reason. So, Bicknell is pointing out, we can't require this belief, but on the other hand, it's totally reasonable, it's held far and wide, it goes back to the earliest days. The language of Scripture bids us view the state of the faithful departed as primarily one of rest and refreshment. So that's what we mainly get from the Bible. But when we consider the moral imperfection of so many who die in the faith of Christ and the impossibility of seeing God without sanctification, without being made holy, that's Hebrews 12:14, it is almost impossible not to think that the life beyond the grave includes discipline through which the character is purified. Some form of purgatory is almost an intellectual necessity, and that's what C.S. Lewis was getting at. Such would, indeed, involve suffering, but it would be suffering voluntarily accepted. We must also place side by side with it the purifying power of joy and of thankfulness. Gratitude and happiness can elevate the character, no less than pain and struggle. No doubt, in the abstract, God could make souls holy in a moment, and that would seem to be the case of those who are around at the second coming. And we dare not say what the very experience of death may be able to effect. So death itself makes sense. For some people, it would be like the experience of martyrdom, where the martyrs go straight to heaven because they have let go of all carnal attachments. Uh, let's see, well, we dare not say what the very experience of death may be able to affect, but such an act of immediate and irresistible moral change contradicts all that we perceive of God's methods. We must be content to admit that we know very little, but we can believe that the growth in holiness begun on earth will be continued and perfected hereafter. So that is his uh, summary on the doctrine. 
Um, he has a note here down at the bottom, comes from, he says, Hort. I don't know who that is. Life and Letters. Um, and in that, it says the word purgatory by derivation simply means place of cleansing, but it has evil associations and probably the term is best to be avoided. Purgatory is not a word that I should spontaneously adopt because it's associated with Roman theories about the future state for which I find no foundation. Uh, but the idea of purgation, of cleansing as by fire, seems to me inseparable from what the Bible teaches of the divine chastisements. And though little is said directly respecting the future state, it seems to me incredible that the divine chastisements should in this respect change their character when this visible life is ended. So he, he brings in there as a note an illustration of this idea that it makes sense that the process of moral development, sanctification, maturity in Christ, and so on, continues after death into the afterlife during that intermediate state. Of course, in Tract 90, uh, John Henry Newman comments on the articles of religion and um, their compatibility or incompatibility with the teachings of the Council of Trent. And uh, he turns to Article 22 for a while and, and addresses the various elements in there. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, and some of the quotes that he brings in are a bit dense. Um, but just to look at some of his summary statements here. Um, and you'll notice, I, I noticed, um, as I was reading things, studying to become an Episcopalian, be confirmed, that basically all of Newman's points, even though it's kind of like he, he lost the battle, he won the war. So the reaction to Track 90 was very intense and negative, and that was part of what kind of pushed him toward uh, becoming a Roman Catholic. Um, but all of his arguments basically end up being accepted and become part of the common, um, common apologetic. So every single book I read that touched on these subjects brings up acceptingly the points that Newman makes. Like here, he points out that, look, it's not the doctrine of purgatory that's condemned, it's the Romish doctrine of purgatory. Uh, it's not the sacrifice of the mass that's condemned, it's this the sacrifices of masses, this multiplication tendency and, and uh, speculation and theology and so on. So, what Newman says here, now the first remark that occurs on perusing this article is that the doctrine objected to is the Romish doctrine. For instance, no one would suppose that the Calvinist doctrine concerning purgatory, pardons, and image, image worship is spoken against. Not every doctrine on these matters is a fond thing, but the Romish doctrine. Accordingly, the primitive doctrine is not condemned in it, unless, indeed, the primitive doctrine be the Romish, which must not be supposed. Now, there was a primitive doctrine on all these points. How for Catholic or universal is a question, but still so widely received and so respectably supported that it may be well entertained as a matter of opinion by a theologian now. This, then, whatever be its merits, is not condemned by this article. This is clear without proof on the face of the matter as regards pardons. Of course, the article never meant to make light of every doctrine about pardons, but a certain doctrine, the Romish doctrine, as indeed the plural form itself shows, not the doctrine of pardon or indulgence, but the Romish doctrine of pardons or indulgences uh, and then he brings up uh, some quotes from um, oh the the homily on uh, idolatry, the peril of idolatry. Um, in these passages, the writer does not positive, does not positively commit himself to the miracles at Epiphanius's tomb or the discovery of the true cross, but he evidently wishes the hearer to think he believes in both. This he would not do if he thought all honor paid to relics is wrong. If then, in the judgment of the homilies, not all doctrine concerning the veneration of relics, that's another part of that article, is condemned in the article before us, but a certain toleration of them is compatible with its wording. Neither is all doctrine concerning purgatory, pardons, images, and saints condemned by the article, but only the Romish. And further, by the Romish doctrine is not meant the Tridentine 
that is, the statements, the canons, the decrees of the Council of Trent. Because this article was drawn up before the decree of the Council of Trent. What is supposed is the received doctrine of the day, that is, what the people popularly believed. And unhappily, of this day, too, and there's still a lot of speculation and just strange, fuzzy doctrine out there, superstition. Um, nor, does he say, is it condemning the doctrine of the Roman schools, a conclusion which is made still more clear by considering that there are portions in the Tridentine statements on these subjects which the article, far from condemning, by anticipation, improves as far as they go. That is, there's some things in the articles that Trent ended up agreeing with. I don't know if they're aware of that at all, but it was a common line of thinking and reform at that time. Uh, Newman says, for instance, the decree of Trent enjoins concerning purgatory thus, among the uneducated and vulgar, let difficult and subtle questions, which make not for edification, and seldom contribute aught toward piety, be kept back from popular discourses, neither let them suffer the public mention treatment of uncertain points, or such as look like falsehood. Session 25. Again, about images. Due honor and veneration is paid unto them, not that we believe that any divinity or virtue is in them, for which they should be worshipped, or that we should ask anything of them, or trust should be reposed in images, as formerly was done by the Gentiles, the pagans, which used to place their hope on idols. If then the doctrine condemned in this article concerning purgatory, pardons, images, relics, and saints be not the primitive doctrine, nor the Catholic doctrine, nor the Tridentine statement, but the Romish doctrina romensium, let us consider, consider what in matter of fact that is. And then he goes on to elaborate upon the basically the corruptions of the primitive doctrine, and it's the corruptions that are condemned. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll pick up next time talking a little bit further, and I think next time we'll go into Francis Hall's uh, analysis of this whole thing. And uh, appreciate you so much. Thank you for joining us. Tune in again. Please like and share. And if you want to write to me, you can write to me at frmatkin at priest.com. God bless.